Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Okay, welcome to week two. So in week one, we introduced MOSFETs, we defined some basic terminology, on current, soft current, subthreshold swings. We reviewed some traditional approaches for computing the IV characteristics of MOSFETs. We presented a simple physical picture in terms of energy bands, which told us physically how the device operates by manipulating energy barriers. And uh, we learned that current for any device, not just a MOSFET, is the product of charge times velocity. We're going to be talking about both in this course. But charge is very, very important. MOS electrostatics determines how that barrier gets pushed up and down, and that's what makes a transistor operate. So we're going to spend a week now diving into MOS electrostatics in a little bit of detail. So today's lecture is about the Poisson equation. So it'll be a review a little bit, but uh, then we'll dive in and, and continue with a more detailed discussion in the rest of the lectures this week on MOS electrostatics. All right, so just to refresh our memory, we talked about energy band diagrams. If we have a uniform semiconductor, then the valence band and the conduction band are just constant in space. We talked about Fermi levels. If it's down near the valence band, then we have a significant number of empty states in the valence band, and we have a population of holes. And if we can assume Boltzmann statistics instead of Fermi-Dirac statistics, we have a simple relation between the density of holes and the location of the Fermi level with respect to the top of the valence band, given by that exponential. There are also a few electrons, even though the Fermi level is far away from the conduction band, and we can determine those few electrons in a similar way by a relation between the distance between the Fermi level and the bottom of the conduction band, or we can do it easier by remembering in equilibrium the product of the electron density times the hole density is this material parameter, Ni squared. Okay, there are a number of assumptions. Uh, this only works in equilibrium. We're assuming Boltzmann statistics so that we can use exponentials instead of Fermi-Dirac functions, Fermi-Dirac integrals. And we have a uniform electrostatic potential so the bands are flat. Now what we really want to talk about is what happens when there is an electrostatic potential that is spatially varying inside the semiconductor. We're going to be doing things like putting a gate voltage on. It'll be near the top of the semiconductor. If I apply a positive voltage to the gate, that's like putting positive charge on it. If I have my p-type semiconductor, then the the boron dopants are negatively charged. Each one creates a hole which is positively charged and the semiconductor is neutral. But if I apply this gate voltage, the positive voltage pushes holes away from the surface and there will be a region near the surface where there will be a very small density of holes and I've uncovered these negatively charged acceptors. So now I've got a charge. If I ground the back of the semiconductor, the potential is zero there. The potential at the gate is positive, so the potential in the semiconductor near the surface by the gate is going to be positive also. In fact, if I plot that electrostatic potential versus position, it's grounded back here in the semiconductor, and then it will just increase as I go towards the surface. The potential at the surface is an important potential, and it's just, we're going to label it the surface potential. And if we understand the surface potential, it'll tell us an awful lot about what's going on inside the device. Okay, so the electrostatic potential affects the energy band diagrams. Remember from freshman physics that a positive potential lowers the energy of an electron. So the conduction band position is basically going to be uh, a constant where where it was when the electrostatic potential was zero, and then lowered by Q times the electrostatic potential, whatever it is at that particular location in space. So the energy, band bends, uh, energy bands will bend down when the electrostatic potential goes up and becomes positive. So in the case that we've been talking about with the electrostatic potential increasing from the bulk towards the surface, the energy bands will bend down and we'll get an energy band diagram that will look like that. So the electrostatic potential increasing means energy bands bend down. Okay, now also since the 
it's the electrostatic potential that's pulling the band down, we can very simply look at an energy band diagram like that and determine the electric field. It's just related to the slope of the energy band diagram. Okay, now just to calibrate ourselves on what we're talking about here. We're looking at a MOSFET. We're just looking at how the bands bend from the gate into the bulk of the semiconductor. So we're looking in the Y direction, the direction normal to the channel. And it's going to be easier for us to draw energy band diagrams if we flip this MOSFET on the side and the Y axis will go from the left to the right. So we're just talking about the heart of the MOSFET, you know, not the regions near the source and the drain. We're assuming that the channel length is very long. We don't have to worry about any two-dimensional effects yet. Uh, those are very important, but we'll come to those in, uh, in due course. Okay, so let's look at the energy band diagram and uh, let's look at it under what people call flat band conditions. And flat band conditions, um, if we put a metal gate on, put a p-type semiconductor, start with a p-type semiconductor and insert a thin SiO2 layer, if we just happened to find the right metal that had the right work function, such that its Fermi level lined up with the Fermi level in the semiconductor, then no charge would transfer, there would be no electrostatic potential set up, all of the bands would be flat. This is what we call flat band conditions. Uh, now, in general, um, a, a voltage will change that. In an ideal structure, if I apply zero voltage, the bands will line up this way and be flat. But this rarely occurs in practice. Metals have different work functions. Uh, that's what VG prime means is that in practice I'm going to have to apply some voltage in order to line the Fermi levels up and make the bands flat like this. And that's an important voltage called the flat band voltage. But for now we're going to assume that that just magically happens at zero gate voltage because we have the right metal with the right work function such that everything lines up. So this will be our starting point, flat band conditions in the device and we're ignoring these metal semiconductor work function differences for now. All right, so let's take a look then at uh, what would happen if we apply a positive gate voltage. Positive voltage at the gate lowers the Fermi level in the gate and pulls it down. That induces a positive potential in the semiconductor. The positive potential pulls the energy bands down. So we get an energy band diagram that looks like that. If our reference for zero potential is deep inside the semiconductor, then the electrostatic potential is zero there. Just an arbitrary reference that we're going to use. And since the energy bands go down when the electrostatic potential goes up, as I move towards the surface, the electrostatic potential will increase. And it's just the difference between the conduction band in the bulk and the conduction band at any position Y. So that's how we define electrostatic potential. If I go all the way to the surface, that's my surface potential. Okay. All right, now let's apply a negative gate voltage instead of a positive gate voltage. If we apply a negative gate voltage, we pull the Fermi level in the metal up. That induces a negative potential in the semiconductor. A negative potential in the semiconductor raises the energy levels. So the bands bend up. When the bands bend up, the valence band gets closer to the Fermi level, and if the valence band is closer to the Fermi level, we get more and more holes. So this negative voltage on the gate is attracting mobile positive holes in the semiconductor. They're piling up at the surface, and this is what we call accumulation. Bands bend up, surface potential is negative, hole density increases exponentially because it is exponentially related to the separation between the Fermi energy and the valence band. And if I'm interested in the total charge per in coulombs per centimeter squared, I'll just integrate the positively charged holes minus the negatively charged acceptors from Y equals zero into the bulk. And that'll give me the total net positive charge in the semiconductor, balancing the same total negative charge on the gate. Okay, so the key point is that in accumulation, things pile up very near the surface. Mobile holes pile up very near the surface. Okay, let's go back to the positive gate voltage and look a little more closely at that. Positive gate voltage, 
pulls the bands down, the positive charge in the gate pushes mobile holes away. So we can see that on the energy band diagram because the valence band is a long ways below the Fermi level, so there are very few holes. They've been pushed in. We have a region of band bending that we'll call the width W sub D. W sub D is the depletion layer width. We call it depletion layer because that's the layer roughly over which the mobile holes have been pushed out by the positive charge on the gate voltage. So the surface potential here is negative, but not too, or I'm sorry, the surface potential is positive, but not too positive as we'll see in a minute. Okay, we call this depletion of holes at the surface. The bands bend down, the surface potential is positive, and if I ask what is the charge in the semiconductor, well, there's a positive charge in the gate, there must be an equal and opposite negative charge in the semiconductor, and if we look at that negative charge, well, we've got mobile holes, but we've pushed them away from the surface, so there are almost none. We haven't pulled the bands down far enough to get a significant number of electrons, so there are almost zero electrons there. But we've exposed the negatively charged acceptors, the p-type acceptors. So the result is that uh, in this region between y equals zero and wd, we have a charge minus q times the doping density. That's the charge in coulombs per cubic centimeter. And if I go beyond that, the semiconductor is neutral because I've got holes to balance out those acceptor charges. So that's what the charge in the semiconductor looks like under those conditions. Now, we'd like to solve this problem and understand things like the electric field and how the bands are bending spatially. To do that, we solve the Poisson equation. So you've all seen the Poisson equation, but let me remind you. The way I remember it first is divergence D is equal to rho, where rho is the charge density in coulombs per square centimeter, and D is the electric displacement field. In 1D, divergence is the derivative with respect to y, our one dimension that, over which things are varying. Okay. Well, remember that the displacement field is dielectric constant times the electric field. So I can rewrite the Poisson equation as the E dy is equal to uh, den charge density over in coulombs per cubic centimeter over dielectric constant of silicon. Now also remember that the definition of electric field is minus the gradient of the electrostatic potential. So if I put that together, a second way that we can remember the Poisson equation is it's del squared electrostatic potential is equal to minus the charge density divided by the dielectric constant. So when I say Poisson equation in this course, I'm either referring to the first way, divergence D is equal to rho, or the second way where I'm expressing it in terms of the uh, Laplacian del squared of the electrostatic potential. Okay, so let's solve a problem. Uh, we have depletion. We want to solve the Poisson equation. So we'll start by writing down the Poisson equation. We can estimate the charge density in this region near the surface over which we've pushed all the holes away and we've only exposed the negatively charged acceptors. So the charge density is minus Q times the doping density if the acceptors are fully ionized and they tend to be at room temperature divided by the dielectric constant. So it says that the slope of the electric field is negative in this region near the surface. Well, the band bending only extends into a depth WD, so the slope has to go to zero at WD. And then we just have a constant negative slope, and we can extrapolate that to the surface, and it means that at the surface we'll have an electric, a positive electric field, E sub S. Physically, we know it's positive because we put a positive charge on the gate, balanced by a negative charge in the semiconductor, so the electric field points from the positive charge to the negative charge. Okay, so now we can just write down the equation of this straight line. The electric field has to go to zero at WD, so it's proportional to W sub D minus Y, and uh, the slope has to be minus QNA over epsilon, so we can solve for the electric field as a function of position, and it's just this nice, simple, linear function. So that's a solution of the Poisson equation. Knowing what the electric field at the surface is going to be very important. We know it's zero at the, at the boundary of the depletion region. Its value at the surface, we just put y equals zero, 
in this equation. And if you put y equals zero, we get QNA WD over the dielectric constant. Now, Q times the doping density is the charge per cubic centimeter, actually minus the charge per cubic centimeter. If I multiply by the width of that region, it's like I'm integrating in depth, and that's the charge per square centimeter. So what this says is that the electric field at the surface is minus the charge per square centimeter in the semiconductor divided by the dielectric constant. And that's also something we could have gotten directly from the Poisson equation, divergence d is equal to rho, just by integrating a little pillbox around the surface. So that's an important relation that we're going to make use of frequently. Okay, so um, let's continue. Um, we've solved for the electric field, let's solve for the electrostatic potential. Remember the definition of the electric field is minus the gradient of the electrostatic potential. And that means that the electrostatic potential is minus the integral of the electric field. Well, the integral of the electric field versus position is just the area under this curve. That's a triangle. So the area is one half the electric field at the surface times the width of the depletion region. That will give us the total potential drop across this region, which is the surface potential. So we can take this expression. We already have an expression for the electric field that's a surface, and we can get a very important and very useful expression that tells us the width of this depletion region as a function of the positive surface potential that is applied. And we find that the width of that depletion region goes as the square root of that surface potential, and it goes as one over the square root of the doping density. So high doping densities, we have thin depletion regions. Uh, high, high band bending or surface potentials, we have deep wide depletion regions. So when I put a red box around the result, it means it's an important result. We have a lot of equations here. When I put a red box around it, it means this is an important one. We're going to use this frequently. Let's try to remember it. Okay, so bottom line is we have a nice simple relation between the width of that depletion region and the potential in the semiconductor at its surface. We also know what the charge in coulombs per square centimeter is. It's just the charge in coulombs per cubic centimeter times the width of that region over which the charge occurs. So now we have a nice expression for the charge in the semiconductor. It's also proportional to the square root of the band bending. This is the depletion charge. Depletion because it's just due to the charge that's left over after we push the holes away and deplete the surface. So under these conditions, positive surface potential, but not too positive, as we'll see. The charge in the semiconductor is the depletion charge, and it goes as the square root of the surface potential. All right, well, let's continue. Let's bend the bands a little more and see what happens. So if I bend the bands a little more, make the surface potential even more positive, eventually I'm going to reach a condition where I pull the conduction band down near the Fermi level. When I do that, I start to get a significant population of electrons. Now in the bulk, the Fermi level is far away from the conduction band, so the number of electrons is very, very small. It's just Ni squared over the number of holes, and it's tiny. But if I look at the surface, it's going to get much bigger. And it gets bigger because we're pulling the conduction band down closer to the Fermi level. We pull the conduction band down by the electrostatic potential. So there's a very simple relation between the electron density per cubic centimeter at the surface and the electron density in the bulk, Ni squared over Na. It's just the bulk value multiplied by this exponential factor, e to the q surface potential over kT. And that just comes in from the fact that the electron density is exponentially related to the separation between the conduction band and the Fermi energy, and the surface potential has lowered that separation. So now we can ask a, an important question. How much band bending do we need to make the electron density at the surface equal to the hole density in the bulk? Remember, the hole density was fairly significant. It was given by the doping density we put in. So we just equate these two. We equate the electron density at the surface to the hole density in the bulk. 
and we get another very important relation, which is why I put a red box around it. We find that the surface potential we can write as some critical value 2 psi b, and just by solving this equation, we find that psi b is kt over q log na over ni. So the doping density might be 10 to the 17th per cubic centimeter, 10 to the 18th. For silicon, the intrinsic carrier density Ni is on the order of 10 to the 10th. So this is log of 10 to the 7th or 10 to the 8th times 0.026. So we can find out how much band bending is needed to get a significant population of electrons at the surface. And that's called inversion. We've inverted the semiconductor surface from p-type and made it n-type. Now, when we do that, what we've done is we've pushed the semiconductor depletion region deep. How deep? We're going to label that W sub T. And we can find that just by taking this critical potential and inserting it into the expression that we got for the depletion region. Remember, the depletion region was proportional to the square root of surface potential, and the critical surface potential is 2 psi b. So that's how deep the depletion region is at the onset of inversion. And now electrons begin to pile up very close to the surface. So this isn't the only charge anymore. Under these conditions, we have this depleted charge, which goes to zero at about the edge of the depletion region. But we also have a pile up of additional negative charge representing these mobile electrons that are piling up. This is what we call the inversion charge. These negative charges are mobile. So these are the charges that give me current flow in the MOSFET, not the depletion charges. So we're going to be interested in that inversion charge for a MOSFET. The total charge is the sum of the depletion charge and the inversion charge, but the inversion charge is what carries the current. Okay, so we've talked about MOS electrostatics. Our starting point was this ideal flat band conditions, which in an ideal device occurs at zero gate voltage, but in a real device is offset by metal semiconductor work function differences. If I apply a negative gate voltage, I pull the bands up. Surface potential is negative. Holes pile up, and we call that accumulation. If I apply a positive surface potential, the bands bend down. At first, we call that depletion. We just push holes away. If we bend the bands down far enough that electrons begin to pile up near the surface, we call that inversion. Okay. So now we could sketch the charge density in the semiconductor as a function of surface potential. Yeah. If I have a negative surface potential, holes pile up very rapidly because we bring the valence band very close to the Fermi level and, and the hole density goes exponentially with that separation. So the positive charge density piles up very rapidly. If I apply a positive surface potential, the charge builds up more slowly as we push the mobile holes deep into the semiconductor and expose the depletion region we've seen that that charge grows as the square root of the surface potential. But once we've bent the bands far enough, such that we get a significant population of electrons, now the electron population near the surface begins to build up very rapidly, and we get a very strong increase of negative charge due to those inversion carriers. Okay, so that's our basic picture of MOS electrostatics. We're going to talk much more about it uh, for the rest of the week, but I'll just remind you of the three key points for this lecture. The gate voltage bends the bands in the semiconductor either up or down depending on the sign of the gate voltage. The resulting charge we either call accumulation of majority carrier holes in this case, uh, depletion, pushing the majority carriers away, or inversion. And to understand MOSFETs, we're going to need to talk about several other things. We're going to need to understand how this inversion charge is related not to the surface potential, which we can't control externally, but to the gate voltage, which we can control. So we have to relate that surface potential to the gate voltage. And uh, that's going to be the key task for the next lecture. So thank you. I'll see you for lecture uh, two this week.